Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... On the streets of Belgrade, heavily armed Serbian soldiers walk the streets. The army guards a large complex of buildings that have been turned into a temporary hospital. The buildings are lined with beds ready for possible COVID-19 patients. The country's president, Alexander Vucic, has warned citizens that Belgrade will not have enough space to bury the dead if people ignore his lockdown orders. Vucic announced a state of emergency on March 15th. Serbia has put into effect some of the strongest measures in Europe to stop the spread of the new coronavirus. Parliament is suspended under the orders. Serbian borders are closed and a 12-hour curfew is in effect. The measures also bar people over the age of 65 from leaving their homes. Critics say Vucic's actions are unconstitutional. Rodajab Savic is Serbia's former commissioner for information of public importance and personal data protection. He said the president of Serbia holds only ceremonial responsibilities under the country's constitution. But he said Vucic has taken total power of decision-making during the crisis. He said... He issues orders which are automatically accepted by the government. No checks and balances. Several European leaders are ordering similarly strong measures on the public. These include unrestricted government observation of cell phone use and long jail sentences for those who violate lockdown orders. Ingeberg Solun Gisladotter leads the Democracy and Human Rights Agency of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. She said she understands the need for fast action to protect the public from COVID-19. But she said the newly announced emergency orders should include time limits and parliamentary control. A state of emergency, whether it is declared and for whatever reason, must be proportionate to its aim, she said. In times of national emergency, countries often take action that restricts civil liberties. Such action can include spying on citizens, ordering curfews, banning travel, and limiting rights of free expression. China ordered lockdowns of whole cities earlier this year to stop the spread of the virus. India ordered a countrywide lockdown. Amnesty International researcher Massimo Moratti said states of emergency are permitted under international human rights law. But he warned that they should not become a new normal. He said emergency orders should remain in effect only as long as the danger remains. In the European Union member country of Hungary Monday, Parliament passed a number of severe new laws. One permits the government unrestricted power to order laws during the state of emergency. Another sets prison terms of up to five years for people who spread misinformation and up to eight years for people who violate orders that restrict movement. 
Critics say the Hungarian action creates the possibility for an unending state of emergency. They say Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his government will be able to control the press and restrict human rights without any supervision. Tanya Fayan, a member of the European Parliament, was among the critics. She said Orban had abused coronavirus as an excuse to kill democracy and media freedom. The world's busiest land border has fallen quiet. Restrictions meant to contain the spread of the new coronavirus have stopped millions of Mexicans from making daily trips north to the United States. That includes many who work at U.S. businesses. At least four million Mexicans who live in cities along the 3,144-kilometer-long border have been affected by the restrictions on travel. The measures do not permit short crossings into American cities to visit family, get medical care, or buy goods. Many of those affected have legal border crossing cards, which are meant for visits not related to work. Reuters reporters spoke to more than 20 people who live in Tijuana, Nogales, and Ciudad Juarez. Most use their cards to care for family members on the U.S. side of the border. Some use them to work illegally. All of those who spoke with the reporters said they could no longer make the crossing. This has also affected businesses on the U.S. side of the border that hire them illegally for agricultural jobs. I don't know what I'm going to do without money. I'm just waiting for a miracle, said 28-year-old Rosario Cruz. She is a mother of two young children and works for a cleaning company. The coronavirus restrictions have stopped all non-essential travel across the border. However, the restrictions do not stop Americans from going to Mexico. The U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency said it did not have an estimate of how many Mexicans with border crossing cards work illegally in the United States. But U.S. and Mexican immigration experts believe the number is high. The U.S. State Department says more than four million border cards have been issued since 2015. The cards can be used for 10 years. Before the coronavirus restrictions, more than 950,000 people entered the United States from Mexico every day. That information comes from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. Andrew Selly is president of the Migration Policy Institute, based in Washington, D.C. He said limiting border crossing to fight the pandemic was understandable. But he worries that in cities such as San Diego, California, or El Paso, Texas, businesses that really should be open in the middle of a crisis might find that they don't have employees. We're talking about farm work. We're talking about caregiving, he said. Researchers have identified a new bacterium that feeds on polyurethane, a kind of plastic that is difficult to recycle or destroy. 
Scientists say the discovery could help reduce a flood of hard-to-recycle plastics that are ending up in the world's landfills and polluting oceans. A team from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig, Germany, found the new strain of soil bacteria. It was identified in an area that contained a large amount of plastic waste. The team discovered the bacteria were feeding on polyurethane diol, a substance widely used in many different products. The researchers estimated that in 2015, polyurethane made up 3.5 million tons of Europe's plastics. One problem is that recycling polyurethane requires a lot of energy. The plastic material does not melt when heated. Most polyurethane-based products end up in landfills, where they can release dangerous chemicals. The team found that the bacterium, identified as Pseudomonas putida, can produce enzymes that eat away at polyurethanes. This would make it possible to break down the material in the environment. The results were recently reported in a study in the publication Frontiers in Microbiology. Hermann Heipieper helped write the report. He said in a statement, the finding represents an important step in being able to reuse hard-to-recycle polyurethane products. The research is part of a European Union program that seeks to find useful microorganisms. The goal is to identify living things that can help turn oil-based plastics into substances that can be broken down biologically. Similar experiments have been carried out in the past. In 2011, Yale University students discovered a fungus that could feed on polyurethane plastic even in a place without air, like at the bottom of a landfill. Since then, scientists around the world have identified other kinds of fungi that can break down polyurethane. In 2017, a team of scientists identified a fungus that can feed on plastic by breaking down the main chemicals holding it together. The German study noted that plastic-eating bacteria could be easily controlled and produced for industrial use. The researchers said the next step is to identify more information about the bacterial enzymes that can break down polyurethane. Some scientists advise against introducing man-made enzymes or microorganisms into the environment that could be harmful. Scientist Douglas Rader wrote about the issue in a 2018 article for the Environmental Defense Fund. He said much more study should be carried out to learn about the complex relationships between plastics and marine ecosystems. Such research is needed before we can take drastic action such as putting plastic-eating bacteria into the ocean, Rader wrote. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, 
and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We continue the story of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Kennedy, a Democrat, defeated Republican Vice President Richard Nixon in one of the closest elections in United States history. He took office in January 1961. After three months, Kennedy faced a major foreign policy failure. On April 17th, armed Cuban exiles tried to invade Cuba, less than 150 kilometers from the American state of Florida. They had been trained by the Central Intelligence Agency. Their goal was to overthrow the island's communist leader, Fidel Castro. In 1959, he and his guerrilla forces had overthrown Fulgencio Batista, the president who was supported by the United States. The exiles came ashore at Cuba's Bay of Pigs. Most were killed or captured. The last administration, under President Dwight Eisenhower, had planned the invasion, but Kennedy had approved it. After the failure, some Americans again wondered if the 43-year-old president had enough experience to lead the nation. In May 1961, Kennedy went to Paris and met with French President Charles de Gaulle. Kennedy visited France with his wife, Jacqueline, who spoke French and had studied there. In June, Kennedy met in Vienna with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev did not want to compromise on any issue. He threatened to have the East Germans block all movement into and out of the Allied-controlled western half of Berlin. In November, the East Germans, with Soviet support, started building the Berlin Wall to separate East and West. President Kennedy quickly announced a large increase in American military forces in Germany. Less than a year later came the Cuban Missile Crisis. On October 22, 1962, President Kennedy made an announcement to the American people. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact 
that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Upon receiving the first preliminary hard information of this nature, last Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., I directed that our surveillance be stepped up. And having now confirmed and completed our evaluation of the evidence and our decision on a course of action, this government feels obliged to report this new crisis to you in fullest detail. The characteristic of these new missile sites indicate two distinct types of installations. Several of them include medium-range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead for a distance of more than 1,000 nautical miles. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States, in Central America, or in the Caribbean area. Kennedy had a warning for the Soviets. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Kennedy and his national security advisors debated what to do about the Soviet missiles in Cuba. Should the United States try to destroy them? What if some of the nuclear missiles escaped the attack? Kennedy decided to use a naval blockade. He called it a quarantine to prevent any more Soviet ships from reaching Cuba. There were tense negotiations with the Soviets. Khrushchev demanded a promise that the United States would not invade Cuba. Kennedy agreed and did so publicly. Secretly, he also agreed to another demand. He promised that the United States would remove its Jupiter missiles based in Turkey after the crisis was over. The Cuban Missile Crisis lasted 13 days. It raised fears of a nuclear war. But it ended peacefully when the Soviets agreed to remove their missiles from Cuba and turn their ships around. But the Cold War continued. In Asia, the Kennedy administration tried to fight communism in Vietnam by increasing the number of American military advisors there. The United States and the Soviet Union did make some progress on arms control. In 1963, the two nations agreed to ban tests of nuclear weapons except underground. Kennedy also had to deal with domestic issues, including discrimination against blacks. His brother, Robert, was attorney general, the nation's top law enforcement official. The Justice Department took legal action against states in the South that violated laws on voting rights. The administration also supported a voter registration campaign to sign up more black voters. Robert Kennedy repeatedly called on National Guard troops to protect blacks when they tried to register to vote or attend white schools. President Kennedy said the situation was causing a moral crisis in America. He decided it was time to propose a new civil rights law that would guarantee equal treatment for blacks 
in public places and jobs. Congress did not pass a wide-reaching civil rights bill until 1964. By then, Kennedy was no longer president. In November 1963, he traveled to Texas. He hoped to settle a dispute in the Democratic Party in that state. The dispute might have affected his chances for re-election in 1964. Kennedy arrived in Dallas in the late morning of November 22nd. The president and his wife were seated in the back of an open-topped car as his motorcade drove through the city. Suddenly, there were gunshots. Bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The motorcade raced to Parkland Memorial Hospital, but doctors could do little to save his life. This was how television newsman Walter Cronkite reported the news. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Police quickly arrested a suspect. Lee Harvey Oswald worked in a building near where Kennedy had been shot. People had seen him leave the building with a gun. Lee Harvey Oswald was a man with a strange past. He was a former United States Marine. He was also a communist. He had lived for a while in the Soviet Union and had tried to become a Soviet citizen. He worked for a committee that supported the communist government in Cuba. Police questioned Oswald about the shooting of President Kennedy. He told them he did not do it. After two days, officials decided to move him to a different jail. Oswald was being led by two police officers. Suddenly, a man stepped forward. There was a shot. Oswald fell to the ground. Television cameras broadcast the events live. The man who killed Oswald was Jack Ruby. He was a nightclub owner in Dallas. He said he shot Oswald to prevent the Kennedy family from having to live through a trial. A commission investigated the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, led the investigation. In its report, the Warren Commission said that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. It said there was no plot to kill the president. Many Americans never accepted that finding. Some blamed Fidel Castro or the Central Intelligence Agency. Others blamed organized crime. President Kennedy was buried in Arlington National Cemetery across the Potomac River from Washington. An eternal flame burns night and day by his grave. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 